One night in December 1833, a weary, footsore youth, with all his earthly belongings in a small pack on his back, knocked for admittance at the door of the tavern on the turnpike in the western part of Natick. Little did the landlord dream that this insignificant-looking young man would one day be Vice President of the United States. This is an excerpt of high school student Chester Heinlein's 1912 essay, winning a competition celebrating the centennial of Henry Wilson in a local newspaper. This is Henry Wilson and the Civil War. As we ended last episode, Henry Wilson departed from Farmington, New Hampshire in December 1833 and began his 100-mile walk towards Natick, Massachusetts. After three days of nearly only walking, Wilson's feet began to blister so badly he needed to stop in Newburyport, Massachusetts, about 50 miles from Farmington, to purchase a five-cent pair of slippers to continue his way to Boston. On that night, exhausted and worn out because of the hilly and arduous nature of his path, he stayed in the home of a Quaker in Linfield, Massachusetts, less than 20 miles left to Boston. The next morning, Wilson got up and finished the first leg of his journey arriving in Boston, intending to walk from Boston to Natick. His historic interests drew him to a few revolutionary sites, including the historic Bunker Hill. Wilson frequently read revolutionary histories, idolizing the founders and military heroes. Wilson also visited the publishing company of so many of the books he had read. From Boston, Wilson finally finished his over 100-mile journey, arriving in Natick at midnight. He had no money, no job, and very little outlook for the future, though what he did have was a passion and desire for knowledge and success. This passion and desire drove him to his new life in Natick, Massachusetts. Wilson, once he went through some of these other towns in New Hampshire and couldn't find something that was suitable financially and otherwise for him, he heard about shoemaking in Natick. This, again, is Henry Wilson expert Joe Weiss. Because Natick was about the third most active manufacturing community in the nation at that time in shoemaking. So it was not at all unreasonable for him to look at Natick. Natick is about 12 miles from Boston and is the 10th mile of the Boston Marathon. The town was settled in 1652 by English minister John Eliot and used as a hub for Native American Christian conversions, which in itself carries a deep and complex history that folks in the town are still wrestling with today. Natick is a quaint suburban town, more so quaint in 1833 than today, but the town still carries a charm. In a trip through the town in the 1700s, George Washington is said to have remarked that, quote, nature seems to have been lavish in her beauties here, end quote. When Wilson arrived in Natick, the town was in its early stages of industrialization. As the 1800s progressed, Natick became a staple of industry along with many others in the Northeast. While Natick later blossomed into a home of various industries, in the early 1800s, it was most known for making the thing Wilson went there to make shoes. While deciding what direction he wanted to take when venturing out of servitude, Wilson had heard of many becoming successful in the shoe industry. Before leaving New Hampshire, Wilson attempted to learn the trade in a nearby town. But the only available way was to apprentice himself out for another two years, which Wilson was not open to. After arriving in Natick, he signed an apprenticeship at a local factory for five months, though after just three weeks of learning, he was confident he could do it on his own. So, he bought out his contract and was once again totally on his own. Unlike in Farmington, Wilson's early days in Natick were much more enjoyable. Soon following his arrival, Wilson made close friends with many, and quickly established himself as an ambitious and hard-working young man. One of Wilson's earliest friends and mentors was Reverend Erasmus D. Moore, 
who Wilson later recounted, quote, was a friend at a time I had neither friends nor power, end quote. Through Moore's Congregational Church, Wilson met Edward Walcott, a staple of the Natick shoe industry, along with Deacon Coolidge, a relatively wealthy, patriarchal figure who admired Wilson and gave him access to his collection of books in his home library, probably the largest collection in Natick at the time. In June 1835, Wilson and his friend Alexander Thayer helped start the Natick Debating Society. The club often met in the Coolidge Library and debated issues of importance to the state and town while reading and practicing their speaking skills and ideas. Around this time, Wilson also joined the Massachusetts militia, which he remained active in up to the Civil War. So back to Wilson's work life. The shoes that were increasingly produced in Natick were called brogans. Brogans look more like a slipper by today's standard. They were made of leather and were often easily made and cheaply sold, primarily to markets in Boston, who would then, in turn, sell them to southern slave owners for use on their enslaved workers' feet. And, of course, uh, boots that were being uh, made for southern and western markets, which would put him, in a way, as time went on, in a compromising position, because there he was uh, about slavery and abolishing it, and yet some of the shoes, boots, and uh, all were going to slave states and to slave owners and maybe to the feet of slaves themselves. In fact, there was, uh, you know, issues that that came up on his business record that indicated uh, where he um, did not take the money when he found out that shoes were being sold to slave owners. And um, so he lost some economic aspects of his business by following, again, principle, and in that case, uh, uh, not, uh, not the practice uh, that was going on. But he looked to be trained uh, in shoemaking, and he connected with Mr. Legro, uh, who agreed to take him on for five months of labor. However, <clears throat> Wilson, Wilson being in a hurry, um, after seven weeks, made arrangements for $15 to have him released in order to start his own business. Following Wilson's short stint as an apprentice, he managed to start making his own brogans and selling his services out to other Natick shoemakers. Wilson primarily worked in his home and was known for working late into the night, usually in 15-hour stints. At some points, he even bothered his landlord. And one other quote uh, that I wanted to mention at this point was, he boarded with Mrs. William Perry, who said, quote, he is a very good young man. We like him much, but he keeps us all awake at night by his continual pounding. And that indicated, uh, again, his continuous work ethic uh, that um, went on and on for those, uh, those few years. And, um, but he was well liked and, you know, well respected at that point. But uh, they had this uh, issue about how much he did overnight and fell asleep, actually. In, in the process of, of making shoes. So he really spent uh, a lot of devoted time on his own after getting tra trained by Mr. Legro uh, in, the, in, in the issue of, uh, of shoe making. Wilson once collapsed while attempting to make 100 pairs of shoes without any rest. He made it to about 50 before collapsing. The work ethic, which was pushed on him from a very young age on William Knight's farm, was still very much enshrined into who he was. Just as Wilson's ambition pushed him towards trade success, his passion for education continued to be a major push in his life. Wilson's strive for new ideas and more knowledge couldn't be confined to the debating society, so in an effort to get a formal education, Wilson pushed his work even further, attempting to raise $700 to send him to school, but instead, his hard work sent his health into a spiral. Because of his lack of rest and probably toxic working conditions, 
Wilson was diagnosed with a lung hemorrhage and ordered to take a vacation to the south where the warm climate would benefit his condition. So that's what he did. In May 1836, Wilson ventured to Washington, D.C. An unusual place to vacation, it's obvious he wanted to experience and see for himself the political rumblings and monuments of the nation's capital. Little did Wilson know, his trip to D.C. would forever change the course of not only his life, but the history of the United States. Wilson's trade ride to the south through the vast but young nation opened his eyes to the true beauty of the American land. But while riding through Maryland, Wilson's eye was caught by a group of toiling enslaved workers in the vast cotton fields of Maryland. While passing the fields, Wilson turned to the man next to him and commented on the abomination of slavery, to which the man angrily told Wilson that those sentiments were not allowed in the state of Maryland. Once arriving in D.C., the horrors of slavery were further brought to his attention as he witnessed sons and daughters being stolen from their families and auctioned off at the William Slave Pen at 7th and B Streets. This type of slave auctioning was common practice at the time, although less than 25 years later, Wilson would be the person to abolish slavery in the nation's capital. While in D.C., Wilson spent his time attending congressional hearings and visiting memorials and monuments. While in D.C., Wilson spent his time attending congressional hearings and visiting memorials and monuments. One month later, Wilson rode back to Massachusetts, engulfed with a sense of vigor and a reimbursed sense of ambition. I think this would be a good point to talk about slavery. Slavery was a brutal and vile economic, political, and cultural system of racism and oppression which held a tight grip over the American continent since its founding in the 1600s. Slavery was first brought to what would be America in 1619. Hundreds of Africans were tightly packed into ships and brought across the middle passage of the Atlantic Ocean. The men, women, and children were treated in inhumane conditions, with many dying on the trip. Once in America, slaves would be auctioned to anyone with the money to buy them. In the 1600s, slaves were much more prevalent in the South, where enslaved Africans would work in the tobacco and indigo plantations. Though less common in the North, slavery was still legal and used. By the 1700s, more than 7 million enslaved men and women were shipped to the American colonies. By the turn of the Revolution, many Northerners grew to oppose the principle of slavery and began to abolish the institution in law. I say in law because in practice, many states continued to let individuals use other humans as property. Southerners were more reluctant to oppose slavery because the South had a much greater reliance on slave labor and a deeper cultural connection. Owning slaves was more than a source of free labor. It was a status symbol and a method of oppression. Out of the 55 delegates at the Constitutional Convention in 1788, 25 held men and women in bondage, even more having owned slaves at other points in their life. Some founding fathers like Thomas Jefferson and George Washington opposed the principles of slavery and hoped for its future abolition while hypocritically owning slaves. Other founding fathers like John Adams opposed the principle and practice never owning a slave. Members of the abolitionist Adams family will frequently appear in Henry Wilson's early political career. Enslaved blacks were forced to intense labor, often sold away from their family, raped, and whipped, along with many other physical and psychological methods of torture and oppression. When Wilson traveled to D.C. in 1835, there were more than two million slaves in the United States, both free and enslaved black people, making up just over 18% of the total population. We'll talk more about slavery as we continue further in the series, and after this episode, you can listen to the first bonus episode, which will go a little deeper into the political standing of slavery around this time. On the first day of July, Wilson attended a school in Stratford, New Hampshire, and then transferred to another school in Wolfboro. In the following spring, he transferred once again to a school in Concord. While in Concord, Wilson was invited to attend an anti-slavery convention in the town. Wilson, politically ambitious, was excited by the opportunity, but also wary of attending, as abolitionist sentiments were still deeply unpopular, especially with the Whig Party, the dominant party in Massachusetts. After all, Wilson did attend and engaged deeply in the assignments, even getting notice from Wendell Phillips, an ardent and nationally known abolitionist. 
Wilson's brief notice from Phillips delighted him and gave Wilson even more courage to enter the ring. Through attending school, Wilson had once again become penniless and found himself unable to continue his academic ambitions. One day after class, Wilson broke down into tears in the woods with his friend John French. Wilson's academic future was crumbling around him, with no support for him to continue. Another friend from one of his previous schools offered Wilson a bed, and Wilson managed to remain in school until the end of the fall term. In the winter, Wilson went back to Natick and began teaching on his own, going back into the shoe trade once the school year concluded. Wilson pushed himself ahead in the industry through difficult times. In 1837, a culmination of errors in the Jacksonian-era banking policies and an inadequate financial system, the Panic of 1837, struck the United States. While many in the shoe industry struggled, Wilson pushed ahead and performed exceedingly well for the economic period. One day, one of Wilson's customers had racked up a debt and Wilson requested it to be paid back. While the man didn't have the financial means to pay him back, he decided he would sell his slaves in order to get the required money. Upon learning he would be receiving his payment through the sale of men, Wilson forgave the debt, which in today's dollars would be in the tens of thousands. Morally, Wilson struggled with his business, as his shoes were made for slaves. But this is a clear instance that Wilson chose his moral principles over his economic benefit. Though financially independent and commercially successful, he found himself spending more and more time in the debating society he had helped establish years earlier. The club practiced debating and discussed politically relevant and historical topics. Wilson used the club to improve his speaking skills, which were rugged and improper. Wilson also had an impediment, which he was able to correct with the help of the group. Wilson soon gained the attention of the townspeople and decided it was time to give politics a go. In 1837, Wilson ran for a seat in the Massachusetts General Court, basically the Massachusetts House of Representatives, on the temperance ticket. And, ultimately, he lost although he did succeed in making a name for himself. Wilson, the boy who grew up with no friends, became very popular in Natick. Before we proceed, it's important to talk about political parties. For many episodes, we'll have to visit back to parties because much of Wilson's life is spent building and leading political factions. Massachusetts was dominated by the Whig Party, an offshoot of the former Federalist Party. The Whigs were mostly aristocratic and northern, while their rival, the Democrats, tended to be more working class and southern. The 1840 Whigs dominated Massachusetts. If you wanted to be successful, you for the most part needed to be a Whig. The Whigs didn't have a clear position on slavery, but the general consensus was that it was opposed, though it was best decided to be left to the states. Democrats were generally pro-slavery, with many exceptions for the northern sects of the party, especially the Democratic Party of Massachusetts. Wilson, delivered by political pragmatism, became a Whig, and spent many of his free hours practicing for debates with Democrats. One of the hot topics of the time was the constitutionality of a national bank. Wilson was known for being quick on his feet and highly knowledgeable. A Democrat once challenged Wilson to a debate, and Wilson handedly won. The challenger vowed to find a more formidable opponent for Wilson to face, and when he did, Wilson showed up to the debate with a stack of books and a confident attitude. When the new opponent saw this, he surrendered, leaving Wilson as the victor. The Whigs promoted Wilson, especially to target working-class communities. Wilson was branded with the nickname the Nata Cobbler in an effort to associate Whigs with workers. It seems that whoever gave Wilson that nickname didn't know much about shoes, because a cobbler is someone who repairs shoes. Wilson made them, making him a shoemaker or cordwainer, titles which appeared in later campaigns. Some have believed that Wilson was given this nickname as an insult, though most biographers have concluded it was given honorably. In 1840, while Wilson was going through a political wave, so was the nation. The election of 1840 was a campaign like none other. Rowdy in nature and impassioned, 1840 marked a turning point for what was to come for America. The Whigs had the opportunity to unseat Democratic President Martin Van Buren and stop another four years of Democratic rule. Wilson traveled the state, campaigning and giving stump speeches for Whig candidate William Henry Harrison, commonly referred to by his nickname, Tipper Canoe. Harrison was branded as an avid outdoorsman and a war hero for his battle at Tippecanoe between the tribal Tecumseh Confederacy and the United States. Wilson's campaigning captured audiences, and he became well-known as an effective speaker and passionate politician. While campaigning for Tippecanoe Harrison, 
Wilson also ran for a seat in the State House. The busy and chaotic election season swept all of Wilson's passions, except for the passion of his heart. In the midst of this crazy time, Wilson met and began to date Harriet Howe. Harriet was soft-spoken, kind, and passionate about education. Wilson had met Harriet as one of his students while teaching in Natick. On October 28, 1840, Wilson married Harriet and just a few days later informed her that he won his seat in the Massachusetts General Court, joining William Henry Harrison in victory. I hope you enjoyed today's episode where we covered Wilson's journey to Natick, his start at shoemaking, his political awakening, and his jump into politics. A funny anecdote I found was that on the night of his wedding, he wanted to give a speech later that night, though probably to the delight of his new wife, due to bad weather, he had to cancel. If you found today's episode interesting, I encourage you to subscribe or follow so you don't miss any new episodes. And if you're interested in seeing some pictures of Wilson's life and doing some more reading, check out henrywilsonhistory.com, my website dedicated to information on Wilson. If you have any questions or comments you'd like to share, please email them to henrywilsonpodcast at gmail.com and I will do my best to respond in a future episode. As always, thank you to Joe Weiss for his input. Thank you to the Natick Historical Society and Museum. You can go to natickhistoricalsociety.org to read more about Natick in the 19th century and beyond. After this episode, you can listen to the first two bonus episodes, which are just a few minutes long and will give a little more context to slavery's political standing in the nation and the Henry Wilson Shoe Shop. I'm looking forward to talking to you next episode, and I can't wait to go deeper on Wilson's life. <laughs>